Today's online presentation focuses on the politics of Ontario, featuring insights from Dr. Andre Perella. I invite folks that are tuning in online, either live or following today's lecture, to visit our blog at provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca to answer it, to ask any questions, uh, seek any answers, and uh, join the join the discussion. So, Dr. Andre Perella is associate professor of political science and director of the Laurier Institute for the Study of Public Opinion and Policy. At at Wilfrid Laurier University. His main research areas include political behavior, participation, electoral politics, political communication, Quebec, Ontario, and Quebec, or Quebec, Ontario, and Canadian politics. Dr. Perella is also a co-investigator on the Shirk-funded Comparative Provincial Elections Project. Thanks for joining us today, Andre, and with that, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wesley, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. This uh, should be a very engaging conversation. Uh, as you know, very recently Ontario held a general election, uh, and like many other general election, it held a few surprises, and I think some insight into maybe what's happening, and not just in Ontario, but also elsewhere in Canada, since, since we're seeing similar patterns repeat themselves. So uh, maybe we can uh, discuss a little bit about that, but uh, I'd like to focus mainly on what's happening in Ontario um, and features that are perhaps unique to this province. Um, I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, I'm going to switch over to that. Uh, hopefully, it will uh, it will work. All right. Um, so the um, the main focus will be the most recent election, and not just because I like elections and that's what I'm most comfortable talking about, but because um, an election says a lot about um, a society, uh, a lot about its politics and its uh, problems, its issues, its challenges, uh, its people, and its vision for the future. Um, so in the most recent election, like as I said earlier, there were some surprises. Um, but I don't think it was a fluke. I don't think it was just an accident. I think the results uh, suggest something, something a little more, more deeper and meaningful than what uh, the numbers would have suggested or, or what the swings in the numbers would have suggested. All right, so let's, uh, let's begin by looking at what I consider to be some important issues. Um, somewhat talked about and increasingly talked about is Ontario's heavy debt. Uh, almost uh, a trillion, or no, actually not, I'm sorry, I misread the number here, uh, almost 300 billion um, and rising, so it, it's a sizable amount of, of debt. Uh, the unemployment rate is 7.5%. Uh, now, this is close to the, can the, the national average Canada-wide, but slightly above the national average, not a whole lot. Uh, the median age is about 40 Again, it's slightly older than the national average, not by a whole lot. Um, but these are important things to discuss because uh, we hear a lot about uh, the, uh, the aging population and the potential impact it will have on social services like health care and so forth. Uh, when you're pressed against huge debt and an, an economy which cannot be said to be robust, then there are challenges, medium-term, short-term, and long-term challenges. Uh, and I think the, the the province feels that a lot. It, it's it's omnipresent, even though it may not always be discussed in every political conversation. Um, and finally, uh, there's a lot has been talked about in terms of the, the decline of Ontario's manufacturing sector. And for the longest time, that was the heart, the core of the Ontario economy. And to an extent, it still is an important part. Uh, but we've heard what's been happening to manufacturing-based economies in the Western world. Uh, more and more factories are opening up in places like China and Mexico and closing in places like Ontario. Um, so this is a struggle for the province, a province that has been accustomed to high-paying union wage factory jobs that manufacture cars, trucks, machine, machinery, and so forth. A lot of that is now taking place in lower wage climates in the developing world. Uh, but what are the top issues according to the voters? In the, the 2014 election, um, Ipsos Reid, uh, an organization that uh, donates uh, its uh, public affairs, uh, oh, there goes my alarm, uh, public affairs data to uh, LISPOP, um, has recently donated its election survey, the one that was conducted on election day uh, a few weeks ago. 
and um, here's a summary of what respondents, and it's a fairly large um, respondent size. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I'm thinking it's four or five thousand people um, that have responded to this, um, what Ipsos calls an exit poll, because it was held right after people voted. So they were asked to, to fill out this online survey as soon as they came home after voting. Uh, and as you can see, the economy is the number one, uh, the, the number one issue, uh, followed by healthcare uh, and the debt. Um, so um, I have to say, I prepared this chart after I came up with my ideas of what are the top issues. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, demonstrate how good of a guesser I am. But my thoughts are pretty much right in line with what the rest of Ontario thinks. That the economy, healthcare, the debt, these are big problems. Uh, number four is, I guess you can call um, the, the scandal issue. One overriding issue in Ontario over the last couple of years has been the so-called gas plants scandal. I'm not going to get too much into it, but basically the, the previous premier, Dalton McGuinty, uh, his government scuttled the plans to construct gas-fired hydroelectric uh, uh, plants in uh, a couple of municipalities in Ontario, uh, Oakville being one of them, and Burlington, I believe, is the other one, uh, in order to secure those seats because people there were opposed to these plants uh, and ended up costing lots and lots of money, millions, billions of dollars, uh, even though the government at the time said, oh, it wasn't all that big of a deal, a couple of million here and there. Anyway, it ended up being a scandal, one that undermined the trust of the government, and it was supposed to be the issue of the election. Well, as you can see, it wasn't the issue. It was an issue, um, but it's not not top three. Um, so, but there was a mood. There was everybody was talking about a mood in this election. It was a negative mood. The parties were negative. People were negative. The leaders were negative. Voters were negative. Um, well, let's take a look at how negative voters really are compared to the last general elections. Um, there was a question asked in Ipsos Reid exit poll. Uh, about whether people simply do not like any of the parties. And they have questions about which party you like and why do you like them. And then one option was, I don't like any of the parties. And the trend was not really uh, suggestive over the years. You know, about 35% did not like any of the parties in 2007. Uh, slightly lower said that in 2011. And then it spiked to 45% in 2014. Um, so obviously there was a bit of a, more of a negative mood, I guess, uh, among voters. Now I have to point out some something uh, which will become a little more evident in, in a second. Uh, this is the third year in a row where an opposition party was supposed to win. The third year in a row where the incumbent Liberal Party was supposed to lose. The third election in a row that the incumbent Liberals won. Um, so we talk about a mood, we talk about negativity, we talk about all these big problems, but then the results of the election are suggesting something else. So what's going on here? Uh, and I guess that's that's really a question many are asking. Well, here are some other indicators of a mood. Um, this is a graph of um, uh, three different indicators of, of uh, over the I would say almost generation of elections. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. The red line is voter turnout. We hear a lot about voter turnout. And as we've seen in Ontario and as we've seen everywhere else, it's been on the, on the decline over the last 20, 30 years or so. Well, it went up a little bit in the last election. Some say because people were so mad, they were so negative, they were so upset that they made an effort to vote. Um, the blue line is something that has become a little bit more discussed in the last election. Uh, I don't know if this is available in every province and in every election, but when you go vote, when you present yourself to the scrutineers and you give your ID card, uh, and then they check you in, they give you a ballot. At that time, you have a choice to so take the ballot and go into the little box and vote, or take the ballot and, and give it back to them empty and say, I refuse. It's a declined vote. Uh, and some people are, uh, some uh, advocates were saying, if you don't like any of the parties, and as we've seen before, there was a, a more more people in this election, more voters who did not like any of the parties. Well, if you really don't like any of the parties, there is a way to vote for none of the above. None of the above is not explicitly stated on the ballot, and some say that it might that's a good idea to actually put it on the ballot. 
Uh, but there's a way to express none of the above by simply refusing your ballot. Um, and I don't know what happened in 1990. This may be a statistical blip, but this is the information I got from Elections Ontario. Uh, but those who actually refused to vote, actually presented themselves to the voting station and turned away their ballot, is really low. It's represented by this axis here. It's, it's rarely, you know, not even half a percent. It's, it's, it's marginal. Well, it spiked in the last election from 2010, where it barely registered 0.05% to almost a little bit more than half a percent. Again, it's a very, very small number of voters, uh, but still, it spiked. And so this, again, may suggest a mood. And the other um, uh, series here is actual spoiled ballots. This is, these are ballots that were filled out. Uh, but incorrectly, either somebody uh, messed it up, they picked more than one candidate, uh, or they just scribbled it, or, or whatnot, or they left it empty. Um, or the, the expressed written intention cannot be unambiguously interpreted. In other words, we don't know what the voter really picked. Uh, is that an X? Is that a check? Is that a, you know, a number? We don't know. So when ballots are looked at, they have to comply by a certain format and how you actually fill it out. And these... Um, can be rejected uh, as um, incomplete or as uh, ineligible or spoiled. And again, we've seen a bit of a spike in uh, spoiled uh, ballots. Not as much as we've seen in previous years. I guess people were more um, educated on how to vote, um, but it's unclear. But, but these are clear. The refusal is the, exp the, the voter actually say, I refuse to vote um, at, in front of the scrutineers. So this is an, an indicator of some kind of a negative mood. Um, so I guess more people showed up to vote and more people showed up to not vote, uh, I guess you can say. Again, this is, this is indicative of, of you know, something's happening here. What's going on? Uh, the, the plate tectonics in Ontario are shifting. Or are they? Well, this is um, um, seat projections that LISPOP puts together. Uh, we basically take a bunch of polls and try to translate the poll numbers into seats uh, by looking at how the poll numbers... Uh, uh, reflect party strengths in various regions, and then we, we run a little bit of a, an analysis to determine how uh, the parties stack up in terms of actual seat numbers. And what we've seen is, as I said earlier, the Conservatives were supposed to win this election. They were leading in the polls and leading in our seat projections for quite some time. And then the Liberals broke a lead and they ended up winning the election with a majority. So the liberal minority government that was elected in 2011 was replaced by a liberal majority government in 2014, all amid a context of people wanting change, of desiring change, a mood that is negative towards the political system, negative towards the parties, and yet we're seeing pretty much a result that suggests people want stability. They want more of the same. Um, so that gets a lot of us scratching our heads. Um, now, um, also, in the Ipsos Reid survey was, were questions that asked, well, what did you like about the party that you voted for? The main reason that you voted for whatever party was what? So on the top row here, you see the party labels, Progressive Conservative, Liberal, New Democratic, New Democratic Party, and all the other parties. Um, the top columns, I should say, or top row in the columns. Um, and each row is an attribute, a reason, a motivation. And as you can see, uh, um, most progressive conservatives and most liberals um, voted because they like the party or candidate best. Now this is kind of ambiguous because when you vote, um, theoretically you're voting for a candidate to represent you in that writing. Uh, but a lot of people don't even know or care who the candidate is. They choose, uh, they, they wish to, to, to express an ex support for a party. Um, and some people don't like the party but like the candidate, and some people um, like the party but don't like the candidate, and it creates some tension. Uh, here they lumped it together, so I can't really be sure what to make of this. Um, but um, it's indicative here that uh, people who voted liberal were more likely than the other parties to say they voted liberal because they wanted to make sure some other party or some other candidate did not win. The progressive conservatives, for the third time in a row, were supposed to win an election, and for the third time in a row, messed it up. Um, in 2007, the leader said something about his intent to, 
or his preference or his, or his uh, belief that um, uh, public funds should be extended to, uh, to schools um, that are faith-based. In other words, there, there's a public school system, and in, in Ontario there's also a Catholic school system. Well, that should be extended to other, other uh, religious-based um, school boards. Uh, you know, Muslims should have their um, Muslim school board funded by the government, and so on and so forth. Um, and this was misinterpreted. It was spun in a, in a way that, that totally, totally backfired and the Progressive Conservatives lost in 2007. In 2011, a new leader um, was, uh, not, was not presenting himself in a fresh manner. Um, so, all right, so maybe he lost in 2011 because he wasn't experienced enough as a leader. He, his brand was not yet uh, well developed. But in 2014, the Progressive Conservative leader uh, said a couple things. Um, number one, he said that he he has a plan to 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 create a million jobs, um, and then when everybody did the math, um, they wondered where th those million jobs were would come from. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, um, he, he said that as a, as premier, he will eliminate 100,000 public sector jobs, um, and so that kind of created a bit of a, of a controversy, of a bit, more than a bit of a controversy about an apparent contradiction. On the one hand, you want to create jobs. On the other hand, you want to kill jobs. You want to fire people, um, and that also backfired um, on the leader. And again, it wasn't so much that he would get elected and, and send out a hundred thousand pink slips. It was more along the lines of attrition. Uh, when people retire, those jobs would not be replaced. Um, a lot, a more of a longer term reduction in the size of the public sector. In any case, it backfired. And uh, he was seen as a scary leader with a hidden agenda and whatnot. And the liberal leader, Kathleen Wynne, um, said, "Look, you, you may want to vote NDP. You may, in order to, because you don't like the, the, the progressive conservatives, or you may not even like the liberals. But if you do vote NDP, you will uh, uh, inadvertently um, support the progressive conservatives because of the, the peculiarity of the electoral system, um, which is a, a winner-take-all." And so the liberals encouraged strategic voting, where if a liberal is fairly strong in a, in a writing, and so is the progressive conservative, NDPers would then be encouraged to vote liberal instead of NDP in order to secure that the progressive conservative would not win. So maybe we've seen some of that. So maybe this desire for change was um, attenuated or countered by you know, we want change, but not that kind of change. We, uh, maybe Ontario was, was not ready for the progressive conservative hard right version. Uh, you know, Mike Harris, uh, former premier here, Mike Harris version of, of, of uh, radical right, maybe not radical right, but harder right, uh, right wing policies. Um, maybe this suggests that Ontario I mean, it may not be the most progressive province in Canada, but it certainly is not ready for the type of policies that hurt the province uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, now, also people were asked, when you did vote for whatever party, um, how did you feel? Um, I kind of like this question. Uh, when I voted, I held my nose. While I don't like the party leader, I felt compelled to, to vote for them uh, any, uh, anyways. Um, and you can see the progressive conservatives and the liberals were almost tied in that regard. Whereas um, the other option was when I voted, I felt good about my vote. And you can see the NDP here uh, scoring um, very well. And, and the NDP, um, which held the balance of power during the minority government in, from 2011 to 2014, was really the one that, that brought the election on. They indicated that they would not support a Liberal Party any further, and the Liberal Party then dissolved Parliament, uh, or the, the Premier dissolved par Parliament. Um, so the NDP was was um, gaining some popularity because it was, it was seen as, as forcing the government to, to think progressively, to think for the people, to, to, to design policies for families, for workers. Um, and so the, the leader in the party had that kind of a, an image. Curiously, however, um, the NDP's positions on many issues were more of a populist right wing than they were of the traditional uh, social democratic um, uh, brand that the NDP has, has built up over the years. 
And we've seen unions react to that. A lot of unions were no longer endorsing the NDP and instead were shifting their support to the Liberals. Again, a lot of weird things are happening here. Um, and um, this question is a little more clear. How people voted, um, you can see that um, in terms of the, which, which among the party leaders, which one was was the most popular? It was the Liberal Party. Uh, the Liberal Party replaced its the, uh, Dalton McGuinty with Kathleen Wynne, um, and uh, Ontario became yet another province among many provinces in Canada led by a woman. Um, and she was a different a different type of politician. Uh, she rebranded herself and the party um, as fresh, as with new ideas, um, and, and struggled hard to shake off the stench of the gas plants scandal. So this is this is a result of that. A lot of people voted uh, liberal because they liked the leader, and that may have been a, a shift on uh, the the liberal party's campaign strategy. Um, but in terms of the issues, it, it was uh, uh, other parties that, that seemed to have issues that resonated more with uh, with voters. Um, so the leaders were not so um, um, universally popular, um, but uh, and the candidates, well, again, most people do not even know the local candidates. They may know the, the candidate if that candidate has already been elected, um, but for the most part, people vote for the party, and, and we're seeing that ref reflected down here very well. Um, and also, if they really want to change, uh, which party can deliver that which they want? And you see a bunch of attributes here. So which leader, I should say not which party, which leader is seen as more competent on the economy, health care, fighting the deficit, and so forth? Um, and as you can see, the Kathleen Wynne uh, was strongest in, in uh, the attribute of, of managing the economy. Uh, not that much ahead of the PC leader, uh, nonetheless, uh, not not behind either. Not second place, not third place. Uh, and this is this is remarkable. Uh, remember, the top issues that um, uh, felt among Ontarians um, is the economy. Uh, the economy has struggled. Ontario, which used to be what they call a half province, has now become a have-not province. Now, a lot of that may have to do with. Uh, um, the boom in the resource sector with uh, the oil provinces like yourself, like Alberta, and even Newfoundland um, uh, growing the economy based on, on, the, on the development of petroleum sectors. Uh, but nonetheless, Ontario used to enjoy for many, 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 many years uh, the status as Canada's strongest economy, and it has lost that. And it's not an opposition leader that is seen as most competent in managing the economy. It is the incumbent leader, Kathleen Wynne. Um, and same thing for healthcare. As I noted earlier, the, the, the population is getting older, um, and um, people are getting concerned about whether they will have sufficient healthcare when they get older. Which candidate or which leader is most likely, most able to deliver? Kathleen Wynne again is seen uh, as delivering um, uh, better services for healthcare. Uh, the PC leader is seen as more of a, a deficit fighter. And that's not surprising. There's a lot of talk about fighting the deficit. That's why he, he, he wanted to cut 100,000 jobs from the public sector. It's how to bring down the budget and to fight the deficit, and so on and so forth. Um, you can see that, that uh, the leaders varied, um, but it's the two main parties, the PC and the Liberal Party, the leaders of these two parties that got the, the best points, I guess, overall, um, um, and, and re relatively tied in terms of attributes. Again, so Ontario wants change. Well, the kind of change that they're asking for, uh, the kind of change that, that we're trying to measure here, is not all that evident. So what can we uh, conclude about, um, some, about the last election? Number one, campaigns matter, and they matter a lot. As I've indicated earlier, the progressive conservatives were supposed to win this election. They were supposed to win the last two elections, and they lost. Um, and the, the, the Liberal Party was supposed to lose. It's one thing to lose because you've been in power a long time and the voters are bored with you. But voters were mad. They were upset. The gas plant scandal got a lot of people upset. But as shown earlier, yes, they were upset. But it's not the main reason that, it's not the main issue that drove them to the polls. Uh, the economy, healthcare, these other issues were more important. But still, uh, that was a pretty big scandal, and, and it's the type of scandal that would bring down a party. Um, and um, 
the, the Liberal Party um, with, with Kathleen Wynne as a leader, rebranded the party, rebranded herself, rebranded pretty much Ontario politics, um, and uh, that the campaign was the, the time, the intensive context when all of that rebranding occurred. Um, also, um, the, the, everyone talks about the, the debates, televised debates, and how big a deal they are. Uh, um, I, I'm one of those who believe that they don't really matter much. I mean, campaigns matter, but debates themselves alone do not matter much. Uh, and the, the leader that won the televised debate was the PC leader, Tim Hudak. And even I saw that. I, mean, I saw he was very more polished, more more collected. And the Peter that got the most, the, the leader that got the most beating was Kathleen Wynne. Right from the get-go, she had to apologize for almost five, ten minutes about the gas plant scandal. Uh, not that it was her particular fault that she did not make the decision, but she was there. She was around the table when, when the decision was made. So she was guilty, guilty by association at the very least. She lost the debate and won the election. So again, campaigns matter. Um, and this is not unique, though. I mean, what we've seen in Ontario is not necessarily unique. This is not the first province in recent elections that we've seen where... Uh, the party that was supposed to win lost. Just next door in Quebec, uh, the incumbent Parti Québécois was supposed to win a majority in the last election. They, ha they held a minority under uh, Pauline Marois. Um, they went into an election and they lost. They lost to the Liberal Party. The Liberal, parties, the, the Liberal Party of Quebec won with a majority. Um, and, uh, and that party was still um, facing a lot of... Um, um, attention because uh, of the scandals involving gangsters and um, uh, construction companies and unions and, and, and money being the, uh, handed over under, under tables. Uh, the, the Liberal Party of Quebec was supposed to not win that election and it did. Uh, again, so people want change and then they get change but then they go back to sort of the same old type of change. Um, now, um, a couple of other interesting observations. No one really made a big deal of the fact that two of the three party leaders in Ontario, the main party leaders, are women. Kathleen Wynne of the Liberal Party and Andrea Horvath of the New Democratic Party. Nobody made a big deal of it. Now this is very indicative um, and, and although there's a lot, a lot, a lot of ground yet to cover for gender equality in politics, a lot of ground, um, it's not too long ago, I think the majority, I believe, I'm not too sure, correct me if I'm wrong here, the majority of Canadian provinces were run by female premiers um, and so again Kathleen Wynne was among that cohort um, and even Alberta was was uh, former premier um, was a woman um, but no one really made that big a deal and I was even asked by a reporter uh, before the uh, the debates um, like, will, it, will it matter much that um, the PC leader Tim Hudak will be confronted by two, two women uh, op uh, two women uh, party leaders and I said you know what I didn't really think about that and that is it a lot of people it's not um, I think it, it suggests that um, the, the the glass ceiling may be not necessarily broken but it's certainly um, cracked a little bit and maybe there are some holes here and there um, so this is uh, I think a big a big deal but uh, also Kathleen Wynne the premier is openly lesbian again nobody really made a big deal of it um, we've come so far and the issues of, of, uh, of, of, of sexual politics in Canada, where there was a time when uh, uh, an openly gay member of parliament um, still was, was uh, seen as unusual and talked about. Now that's almost like, well, whatever, you know, no big deal. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, shows a big step in, 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 um, in voters and in, in political actors' uh, preparedness for diversity. So I think that's an interesting observation. Um, and also, well, despite some signs for what I call you know, a desire for change, there certainly are other signs for a desire for stability. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. And I think what we're seeing in, in Ontario and other provinces is sort of the end of a period. The end of a period when uh, there was a time when we knew what the issues were, we knew what the stakes were, and we knew who can make things happen. But this global economy where decisions on the economy are made in boardrooms all over the world, uh, where governments are constrained in what they can do in terms of tax laws and whatnot, um, and all these other issues, all these challenges, you know, the internet and the social media and privacy and all that, I think a lot of people are saying, you know, 
what type of world are we in these days? Uh, and we don't know. Um, it's it's uh, rapidly evolving. The economy is rapidly evolving. Um, everything, technology, rapidly evolving. And I think it's uh, people are, are have less of a uh, of a firm grip on on um, for lack of a better world on reality. I don't mean they're they're, they're being delusional or anything, but um, I, I really believe that that they're not sure what is what are um, um, the real stakes anymore. Like what what is reality out there? We don't know. We don't know what the parties can do, and so I, guess, I think if there was a mood, there was a mood that that the parties really can't do much anymore. Um, so I guess whether you whether you vote for a, a new party, whether you elect an opposition party or retain some stability, it may not make much of a difference. And maybe that's also what's behind the, the declines in turnout rate. People are seeing that the elections are, do not make much of a difference because the world has changed so much. We don't know what we don't even know what a difference is supposed to look like. Um, so that could be what's happening there. But there are some um, 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 indications of, 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 a, of a desire to go forward. Um, and in the, the, the government of Ontario, at least, uh, has stated in, in some of its public priorities, such as in its budget, its most recent budget, the same budget that was tabled before the election that the NDP said it, they would, that it would not support, um, is simply the stuff that you see in, in almost any other budget, you know, promoting exports, supporting education, and all these other uh, feel-good, do-good type of projects. What's new is and this is probably the most innovative uh, policy um, uh, development in Ontario, is that Ontario is going to launch its own provincial pension plan. Uh, so Canada has a pension plan. Uh, Quebec has its own provincial pension plan. And, and up until now, was the only province with, with, with its own provincial pension plan. And Ontario is doing the same. Uh, because Ontario government believes that uh, the Ontario citizens do not contribute enough to RRSPs maybe because they cannot afford to, um, so there may be a need for a public pension plan uh, managed by Ontario. You know, and it works like many other pension plans. Workers contribute about 2% of their income. Uh, employers match contributions. It'll be managed by some arm's length board. Um, and um, you know, there are some exceptions as to who can contribute or who can uh, participate. This is an interesting, an, an, an interesting policy dimension. It may not interest many of you, uh, it may not interest anybody really, uh, but in terms of those who, who study policy, uh, this is new. I mean, this this is hot, um, and we'll see where this goes. Uh, and that's pretty much it in terms of the end of my um, PowerPoint presentation. I think I'm going to switch back to uh, um, the camera here if, you want, if, it, if it's any benefit. All right, so I turn it over to um, to Jared. Uh, who may have some questions from the blog? I understand. Great, thanks, Andre. And uh, you've taken us great, uh, given us a great look at the at the 2014 election. And one, the first question I have for you is touching on the theme that you mentioned that that campaigns matter. And as you know, there's a school of thought when it comes to the study of elections that campaigns are not so much about a great debate over policy uh, or left versus right, even. Um, but they're a, a campaign. Uh, to see who can establish the agenda that most favors that particular political party. I think from, from your discussion, it, it, was, it was just a really an odd outcome because, uh, as you mentioned, the top issues that, that Ontarians saw in that election were uh, the jobs in the economy, uh, health care, and the deficit. And it was interesting that the cons concert, and the fourth one was integrity. <laughs> And it was interesting that three out of those four election issues, the Conservatives seemed to feel that they owned, and they were the ones that were actually campaigning on those issues. And yet the, 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 the chart that you showed us in your presentation a little later showed that it was actually the Liberals that owned those issues, in that, in that Ontarians tended to believe that they were the best to manage the economy, health care, and, and even they were favored on the integrity issue. I, th I found that was, that was fascinating, that... Um, the Conservatives actually primed the electorate on three issues that they lost. Is that your read? Um, yes, and I don't think they, uh, they they lost not because they did the right thing. Uh, they lost because their message was distorted. Uh, or maybe they did not communicate effectively what it is that they were after. It's the 100,000 job cuts that, that got a lot of airplay. Um, and um, the way this was spun, and maybe it was the liberal war room that, that really drove this, um, it was spun as... 
Tim Hudak wants to fire teachers. He wants to fire nurses, uh, just like Mike Harris did back in you know the, the 90s, uh, from 95 on. Um, so it wasn't his economic um, platform was spun into um, recklessness. Now here's some guy who just wants to come in and cut jobs uh, blindly. That's how it was seen. Okay, and that's that. That that type of narrative is one way to interpret the election. I'm getting some some questions off of our blog again. People that want to go visit provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca welcome your questions there. Uh, one of the questions on the blog asks um, whether the outcome of this election, and in particular the inability of the opposition parties to oust um, the Liberals when they appear to be a um, you know a, a flagging party in terms of popularity, is that evidence of Ontario being a centrist political culture in that they're They've, uh, in particular, turned away from the extremes of the Harris government and the on the right, and the, and the Ray government on the left. Or is Ontario settling into a centrist culture like Canada was for most of the 20th century, and that's why the Liberals are, are winning, or is that not part of the story? Well, that's part of the story. Um, if you go back in history, I think the NDP won in uh, 1990, not because Ontario shifted left. Um, it's just the, the peculiarities of the electoral system. As you know, sometimes you get a result that is um, a little strange. Um, and um, I'm not saying the NDP lost, lost the election and ended up winning the seats, but they did win the seats. Um, they, they won a majority government in 1990. And I don't think it was because Ontarians were ready for a socialist uh, government. Um, it's just the same reasons why they may have voted for Mike Harris in 95, it's not that they were ready now for right wing, you know, uh, hard right, um, hang them high type of uh, party. Um, they were upset with, with Bob Ray. They were very, very fatigued from the very difficult recession of the early 90s. Um, and the only other, the only party that was um, seen ready to, to address that was um, the progressive conservatives. And Mike Harris was a more effective leader than than uh, uh, the, the Liberal leader at the time, uh, Lynn McLeod, if I remember correctly. Um, so um, it, it it was. Uh, I'm not too sure if, if Ontario's uh, Ontarians have swung uh, widely. They may have shifted a little bit to the right, um, and, and that explains a little bit maybe Mike Harris. But I'm not too sure if they swung to the left. Um, they they may be more prepared to hear the narrative about uh, supporting people in, in times of need. I don't know if that's a, a, a left-wing um, discourse. Um, so they may be prepared for that type of thing, like in healthcare, and maybe even uh, t talk about uh, funding and subsidizing daycare. Uh, but a lot of that was owned by the NDP. Um, so the question is, how do the liberals get away with, with uh, um, benefiting from, from the, 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 the progressive conservatives owned issues on the economy on the one hand and also um, the NDP's owned issues on, on social uh, benefits and, and, and the, the safety net. Uh, well, um, I think it has a lot to do with, with uh, the, way the, um, and I have, the way the campaign was um, communicating what does the Progressive Conservative Party really, what will they really do once elected and what will the NDP really do once elected. Um, and um, the, the, that that type of communication was mostly directed to the progressive conservative, uh, and raised the specter that the progressive conservative, yes, they may have the support of a lot of economists, but they are reckless. They're not. Their ideas are not well thought out. In addition, the million jobs that Tim Hudak said that he would create uh, was undermined. Um, by other economists saying that the math doesn't add up. Um, there was a lot of double counting and uh, then the, the narrative was Tim Hudak should go to school and learn some math. He shouldn't cut math teachers, he should actually hire one for himself. Um, and uh, so the, the narrative is not that which party is, is owns this or that issue. It, I think it had a lot to do with leadership. Which leader was, is most credible on these issues? And um, although the Liberal Party, Kathleen Wynne, did not come out of the, uh, run out the gate uh, owning these issues, I, I think the campaign was spun in such a way that led people to doubt 
whether the Progressive Conservative Party really, really knew what they were talking about when it came to the economy. Perfect. Um, you know, I, I find it amazing. We've gone 40 minutes. We've got about five minutes left in our talk today. We haven't used uh, two words, two names. We haven't used Harper and we haven't used Ford. I wonder if you could talk just a bit about the role of the Harper government and the intersection between the federal and provincial party systems in Ontario. And in that sense, maybe a little bit on, on whether you think that the, the Harper Conservatives, who were, were on the campaign trail in some cases in Ontario, had an effect in any way. And secondly, whether the outcome of this particular election gives us any kind of insight into what might happen in the fall of 2015 with the federal election. Well, there's a lot of talk about that, but uh, and, and I don't know. Um, and I've seen and I've lived in a province where people voted for one particular brand of party provincially and a totally different brand of party federally. I, I lived in Quebec where we had the PQ government in Quebec City and the Liberals in Ottawa, um, Liberal MPs from Quebec in Ottawa. So I'm used to the living in a province where um, voters do not align coherently on party labels provincially and federally. Um, now having said that, um, it, it, it's unclear whether um, Ontario will turn its back on Harper. Uh, Ontario, Har Harper has a lot of support in Ontario. Um, and a lot of traditionally liberal safe seats went conservative in the last couple of federal elections. Um, and it's now, in some cases, a bit of a toss-up as to whether, that, whether the conservatives will retain some of those seats. Um, but it's unclear whether this election will indicate anything about 2015. But it is clear, one thing is certain, uh, is that the war rooms are now looking at their expertise and their staff and their plans and their strategy, knowing that a campaign can turn things around. You can come out of a, you can start a campaign at the top and end up at the bottom and vice versa. Um, so if there's anything about this election and other provincial elections that we've seen is that it has raised the value of the campaign war room so anybody who works in these things can probably fetch a much higher salary now because this is this is where the action is uh, how do you spin the message is the question how do you spin the message of 2015 so if there's one consequence it's looking at the, the 2014 Ontario election um, as an historical battle upon which to draw your strategy for the next campaign and I think that's what all the parties are doing Great, and we have just one question um, from from one more question from the blog, um, and that deals with uh, the geographic distribution of of support in in Ontario. And um, I'd like your insights in particular on the urban rural uh, suburban divide, because I know that you're doing some cutting edge research right now on on the latter, which has not been really studied in in, in Canada before on the suburban vote. Maybe speak a little bit, if you could, about um, your findings in that area and whether that's that's the biggest cleavage in your mind in, in Ontario politics today and moving forward? Uh, you know, that's the one thing I didn't look at. I mean, I probably could with the Ipsos uh, data set, but I, I did not look at that um, because that was the theme of my talk when I did this for you a couple of years ago. Uh, yes, um, we all heard, know about the urban-rural split that in um, places like Toronto, uh, Ottawa, um, residents there, voters there support the Liberal Party. And in the country, in the, the, in the, the farmlands, in the rural area, they support the Conservative Party. Um, that's not unique to Ontario. That's across the country. Um, but then we've seen that there's also a new region, a suburban area. It's not a new region. It's a new region politically. And the suburban areas tend to support conservative writings. Not only that, but we found, and in, in this cutting-edge research that you say, um, we found that suburban voters are even more conservative than rural voters in some cases. Um, now, um, we're not sure exactly why, but there are some various theories, and it's not necessarily about ideology. It could very well be that um, suburban uh, residents are sensitive to taxes, property taxes and services. Uh, in one sense, that they want their property taxes low because their services are low. And anybody who's lived in a suburban area knows that you know, bus service is um, non-existent or, or terrible. Um, you have no sidewalks. Uh, you may have to shovel your own snow. Uh, all these things. So uh, the idea of paying taxes to support some collective domain uh, is not as, as, as salient in the suburban area. 
um, you know, you send your kids to school. You know, why why do we need public pools? We have pools in our backyard. You know, th that's the idea. Um, so why pay huge property tax to support that? Now that's just an example. It's what we call a vulgarized uh, example. It's, it's, there's a lot more to it than that. But that may be part of the story as to why suburban voters are more conservative. They're, they're, they're more, um, uh, they resonate more to the, the message uh, of low taxes. Great. Well, thanks, Andre. Thanks for taking the time to spend uh, talking about uh, Ontario politics, especially considering the later hour in Ontario. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you've answered all of the questions that we have from the blog awesome. and, and more. So. All right. My pleasure. This was fun. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Andre. We'll do it again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.